make their own personal lubricant, which they seasoned with uh, devil's lettuce, if you know what I mean. What? Figuring his wife and the professor were making liberal use of the lube, he decided to season a new batch with a little extra something. Syphilis. <laughs> yeah. What it is, guys? It's Bull Blasphemous HD. And today we are here to check out a video you guys have been sending me in the DMs of the Discord. And it is called Extreme Stories of Revenge That Went Far Too Far. At the end of this video, I will be giving you my own account of revenge that went too far. Let's just say I made somebody a cup of lemonade that didn't have lemons in it. <laughs> <laughs> and they drink it <laughs> the whole thing and he got to drink it for free even though i only told him what he drank after he finished drinking it they say revenge is a dish best served cold but i disagree from some of the stories i found on the web the best revenge is served so hot it's downright nuclear and wet revenge should be served wet and hot like hot cocoa and not the other thing you guys were thinking. These aren't tales of funny, passive-aggressive sticky notes or cute pranks to teach people a lesson. These are stories of life-destroying vengeance and elaborate retribution, from devastating businesses to exposing cheaters in the most damning ways possible. So grab your popcorn and put on your rad suit, because we're about to look at some tales of nuclear-level revenge. Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that shit. I like that shit a lot. Kidney, Kidney come comeback. Back. At some point, everyone with a sibling has found them annoying. But a select few can be downright evil, as a Reddit user by the name of Ryan sadly discovered. Ryan had a twin called Sebastian. As they were growing up, Sebastian bullied Ryan mercilessly. But because Sebastian was the favorite, their parents turned a blind eye to it all. Sebastian would put Ryan down, blame him for things, and have his friends pick on him. Already, Sebastian sounds like a super douche, oh. but it was about to get much worse. When he was about 18, Ryan realized he was bisexual, but Ryan's parents were strict conservatives. Oh, so when he began dating a boy called Daniel, he had to keep it secret. Oh. Unfortunately, Sebastian spotted the two holding hands in public, and like the sad little snitch he was, he ran home to tell their parents. Not only were his parents mad, but Sebastian did everything in his power to convince them to kick Ryan out. And he succeeded. Homeless and cut off, Ryan was completely ostracized. Now we roll forward about 10 years. Oh, Ryan God. and Daniel oh. are married. Mr. Ryan ruined the taste of my hot chocolate. Shit. Living a wonderful life when Ryan gets a call from one of the few family members he's still in contact with. They're at the hospital and don't say much, but ask Ryan to get there as soon as possible. When he arrives, he's greeted by his parents, who suspiciously look really pleased to see him, along with his brother, who's lying in a hospital bed. It turned out, having lived a damagingly excessive lifestyle, Sebastian needed a new kidney urgently. Oh! The waiting list for a new kidney was longer than he had left, but Ryan, being his identical twin, would be a perfect match. My god. What would you want a bisexual kidney for? You don't want a kidney from a dude who's doing stuff that you don't agree with? I have a feeling that this is about to become very different. Very different indeed. After all the hell he put Ryan through, he just expected him to give him a kidney? Well, Ryan was done being taken advantage of, so he gave the most devastating answer possible, a simple no. Shocked, Sebastian called in their parents, who begged Ryan to reconsider. No! He brutally no! reminded them of all the times they'd said nothing when Sebastian hurt him, and they'd kicked him out of the house yep. for being who he was. Yep. It was clear they didn't care for any part of him, including his kidney. Yep. After that, he simply turned around and left. Wow, well, I don't think there's enough ice in the world to treat that burn. That is one of the most delicious stories of revenge I've ever seen in my life. Hard to stomach. Oh, there is nothing worse than opening the work refrigerator only to discover someone has stolen your lunch. Not even a threatening post-it note can dissuade some of these food thieves. But for all the threats, some sandwich stealers learn the hard way 
that the lunch owners aren't joking around. Back in 2008, Reddit user Gustavsson was working in a call center, and a really crappy call center at that. The rules were super strict, there was no ventilation, and the pay was so bad that many people resorted to stealing little things. This apparently extended to staff lunches as well. Yeah, I used to work at one of these call centers. I got jumped within a week and a half by 16 dudes with guns because I called a really, really pretty white girl with hazel eyes ugly for lying and telling people I hit her because I wasn't attracted enough to her to kiss her ass when she would talk crap. Be careful pissing off pretty women. It had gotten so bad that people would routinely spike some food with laxatives or bad milk to send a message, but not even that stopped the lunch thieves. That was until, one day, Gustavsson heard that someone had put a box of food in the fridge with the label, Do Not Eat Rat Poison Inside. Thinking this was a joke, the lunch thief snuck in and gobbled down every last bite. Damn. It wasn't until later that afternoon when a woman suddenly collapsed on the ground, suffering from heavy internal bleeding, oh! that they suddenly realized it hadn't been a joke. The unfortunate lunch thief was taken to the hospital and suffered long-term damage to her digestive tract, oh! Oh! kidneys, and liver. Oh! While the culprit was never identified, I doubt that lady ever stole another lunch. Oh! Oh! Familial revenge. Ah! Ever been to a big family gathering? Man, they can be the worst. Especially if you're the butt of all the family jokes, like Reddit user Why Do You Read Names, who I'll call Max for this story. I would have headbutted that dude in the face. My bad, bro. You brought me within kissing distance, and I don't, I don't kiss dudes, so. My bad, I got PTSD, bro. Oops. Was. Now, one of Max's cousins, Randy, constantly picked on him and embarrassed him in front of everyone at family gatherings. Sadly, the rest of the family just watched this happen, never once telling Randy to back down or stop, even when he went too far. Randy seemed to have it all. Nice house, nice wife, nice kids. But still, he felt the need to pick on Max. Pretty sad for a grown man, don't you think? And so one day, when Max saw Randy in the street with his arms around a woman who definitely wasn't his wife, Max decided to get a better look with his camera. He took out his phone and got several pictures of the couple holding hands, hugging, smooching, tongues and all. Then he had all the photos printed out and waited patiently for the next inevitable family gathering. With everyone around the dinner table, Randy was about to start bullying Max again when suddenly Max dropped all the photos onto the table. The entire family, including Randy's wife and kids, slowly realized what they were looking at. Oh! And then, all hell broke loose. There was screaming, fighting, crying, and Max was kicked out. But it was Randy who ended up paying the ultimate price. In the months that followed, Randy's wife divorced his ass, he lost custody of the kids, and just to add a cherry on top of this revenge Sunday, Max got married. Well, something tells me Randy wasn't invited. Car Wars – Revenge of the Quack. Being a single parent is hard, no doubt about it. But when you're also on a limited income, things like rent and bills can really restrict your options, as Reddit user Galera1 will tell you. They were renting a small, old, drafty apartment. They were quite content and had no complaints until their nightmare neighbor moved in. He had a car he treated like his baby which he'd made multiple modifications to. So many, the engine needed time to warm up. And so, for 10 to 15 minutes every day, he'd let it run, releasing mega plumes of thick, nasty exhaust fumes. Now, Galera wouldn't have had an issue with this, but this guy was assigned a parking space right outside their four-year-old's bedroom, and the fumes were making the kid feel sick. So, one day, Galera kindly asked if he could warm the car up somewhere else in the lot. At this, the driver went berserk, screaming at Galera, telling them he didn't care about the kid and that he wasn't going to move it. Damn! Shocked, Galera left. Damn! They knew an official complaint wouldn't go anywhere, and they didn't have the funds to move. So, they began plotting, on a budget. The next day, they bought a squeezy bottle of Gatorade and broke a couple of eggs into it. 
Then they happened across some fresh dog doo-doo, which they added in, uh, and left the concoction out in the sun for a few days to uh, mature. Finally, oh my God. in the early hours of the morning, on a day that promised to be scorching hot, no! Galera took the Satan soup and snuck up to the car. Satan now, soup? the car was old enough to have those little triangle vent windows, which the driver had left open. And so, Galera sprayed the contents of the bottle into the car, coating everything the vile liquid would reach. They then tossed the empty bottle, snuck back inside, and went to sleep. A few hours later, they were awoken by the sweet, harmonious cries of What. The. F when Galera looked out, the driver was gagging next to his car, trying desperately to figure out where in his car the vomit-inducing smell was coming from. He grabbed a bucket of soap and water and began scrubbing the seats hard, and soon people began to gather around. Oh. Realizing there was no way to stop the stench, he grabbed a wrench and removed both the driver and passenger seats before heaving them into a dumpster. By now, a crowd of at least 30 people were stood staring and laughing, and in front of all of them, he then got in the car, without a seat, and drove away. Golera never saw the car again. Now that is how you put your revenge in gear. God damn. Where were these everyday people superheroes when I was getting bullied in schools? IR sucks to be you. If you want to hit a business where it really hurts, you call in the tax man to take a punt. Back in the early 2000s, fresh out of college, a Redditor called Fancy Cat 11 started a new job at a small drafting and design firm. While the pay seemed good, she soon realized she was also being used as the receptionist, office manager, file clerk, and even janitor. But despite being obviously overworked, she got on with it and never complained. However, just as the year's tax returns were due, her boss asked her to request a tax deadline extension for herself. He had a reasonable excuse, so she obliged. But when she asked him for an update a few weeks later, he asked her to request another deadline extension. Now, this was fishy. So fishy that Fancy went through the tax records herself and found the paperwork. It was all done, he just didn't want to sign off on it so he could keep all her tax money in his account while making it look like she was the one failing to pay. Well, Fancy wasn't having any of this. So on Monday morning, she dropped her resignation letter on his desk and then proceeded to walk straight into the offices of the Internal Revenue Service, also known as the IRS. She gave them all the evidence she had against the guy and it turned out Despite taking a tax cut from her pay, he'd never paid any taxes to the IRS under that business name. Oh, the IRS were not happy. But Fancy wasn't done there. She then proceeded to ring all his long-standing business partners, informing them that the IRS was about to go to town on his company, and that they might want to steer clear. After all, they didn't want the tax man investigating them by association, did they? After the IRS investigated the matter thoroughly, much to the dismay of the boss, the business started to fail. Hard. Whenever Fancy walked past, she noticed the entire office looked dirty and empty. A year later, it was closed for good. Moral of this story, don't screw your employees over and always pay your taxes. Tired of it. Don't you hate when someone parks in your spot? It's so annoying. Even more so in bad weather, as Reddit user Meltdown knows all too well. His girlfriend was coming over one snowy night, so he went down to the parking lot and spent an hour digging out a parking space specifically for her. Damn. He then left a little sign, asking others not to park there as he dug it out by hand. But people are douchebags, and in a matter of minutes, some selfish driver had thrown the sign away and taken the spot. Cold and angry, Meltdown aptly had a meltdown. His girlfriend found another place to park and fell asleep in his apartment, and once she did, he grabbed a bottle of flammable liquid, crept down to the car, and proceeded to set all four tires on fire before slinking back upstairs. 
Within Yo! minutes, he could hear the noise of the tires bursting and exploding. The next morning, Meltdown took out the trash and surveyed the damage. And boy, was it ugly. While the overall structure was fine, the driver would need four new tires and a lot of cosmetic work to restore the car. Now that is what you call a full meltdown. Bug off. Ugh, kids can be the worst. They scream, they cry, they throw rocks at you. Or at least they threw rocks at Reddit user Frumpy Fungus. At around the age of 11, he was looking after his little brother one Saturday afternoon when two kids knocked on his door, asking if he'd come out to play. He said no, but they kept ringing the bell. Oh. And when he didn't respond, they decided to throw rocks at his house. Uh, typical kid logic. This kept happening for two more weeks. Damn. And when they cracked one of the windows on his house, Frumpy finally had enough. Little did these kids know, Frumpy was an avid ant farmer God and had a damn. small nest of fire ants. Yeah, as the name suggests, the bites from these things are incredibly spicy. Fire ants? So, Frumpy took the little glass farm over to the patch of rocks the kids usually used and dumped the ants all over them. Oh. Later that day, right on cue, he could hear the crack of rocks hitting the side of the house. But suddenly, the cracking stopped and was replaced by the crying of a few dumb kids. The ants were all over them. Oh my they ran God. back home like the babies they were. But they weren't done there. Instead of throwing rocks, the kids resorted to stealing toys out of Frumpy's yard. Damn. Unlucky for them, Frumpy owned more bugs and had the smarts to set up a trap. He filled an old book bag with Legos, dolls, all sorts of toys, and left it in his yard. Sure enough, a few hours later, it was gone. What the thieves didn't know was that Frumpy had dumped his entire termite farm in there as well. A few weeks later, and the kid's house was under a big old quarantine tent. I don't know if you've ever had to call the exterminators, but fumigating an entire house like this can cost thousands Damn. of dollars. Oh boy, I bet their parents were furious. Well, sometimes revenge smells sweet, but other times, it smells like chemical fumes wafting down the street. Aww. Bad eggs. While kids can be bad, teenagers can be so much more annoying. For proof, we need only look at Reddit user Alaska Guy Index Story. The teens in his neighborhood thought, with their adorably underdeveloped brains, that it would be really funny to repeatedly egg all the houses in the middle of winter. In the minus 15 degree Fahrenheit weather, the egg would freeze solid, and it'd be almost impossible to get off until spring. Sick of scraping eggs off the side of his house, Alaska guy came up with a plan. He and his brother would layer up and wait on the roof of the house until the teens inevitably came round again. Only this time, they'd have paintball guns, so they'd get a taste of their own medicine. Just as they expected, the teens rolled up and were about to start yeeting eggs when Alaska guy and his bro began firing. The teens ducked and dodged, but suddenly they were screaming and started running for their truck. Then, as they were hightailing it out of there, the rear window of their truck suddenly smashed. It wasn't until Alaska guy was back inside that he realized the paintballs had frozen solid in their hoppers, so they'd been pelting the teens with balls as hard as rocks. Luckily, the police never came knocking, and unsurprisingly, the eager Eggers never returned to that neighborhood. Damn! Serving Attitude Working as a food server is one of the most thankless jobs out there. The pay is bad, the hours are long, and the customers are rude. They be making Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria type of money, unless they get tips. No wonder most can't wait till closing time. However, back in 2010, a Reddit user by the name of SpangyPH was closing up the pizzeria he was managing with his team when, all of a sudden, he heard yelling and crying from the front of the shop. A group of men had barged in, demanding to be served, and when the young serving girl at the front told them that they were closed, they screamed at her. Spangy came out, and despite telling them that, yes, they were closed, they claimed the customer was always right no. and refused to leave until they were served. Hell no. Ooh, big Karen energy there. Tired and annoyed, Spangy told the...
I done shit in every single pizza. Yep, yeah, all right, well, if you're gonna play these games, you're gonna get our special on the house shit and piss pizza. It tastes a lot better than it smells, but that's only because of the pizza sauce and cheese we mix in there. You're still gonna get a mouthful of yesterday's hot Cheetos, bitch. Have to fire the ovens back up before taking the girl aside and comforting her. Then they got to making the food with a few extra special ingredients. One of the staff reached into the grease trap and smeared a handful of nasty, filthy black grease onto the dough. The others started spitting, snotting, and even sprinkling a few uh, downstairs hairs on oh, them. Oh, God! Then they smothered it with a layer of tomato sauce, oh. toppings, and served it to the rude crew like nothing was wrong. Oh. The team watched as the pathetic patrons smiled thinking they uh, won, uh, and they guzzled down every last bite. Uh, uh, so, I can't say shit. My story is about peeing on a person. I mixed it with water and sugar. You know what I mean? It's like a hood lemonade, huh? We ain't have no lemons. Well, actually, I think we did put some lemons in there for him, too. So now I'm not even a bad person. Remember, if you like food free of filth, don't be rude to the people serving it to you. The Real Tank Girl There are a lot of badass women in history, but for me, the baddest of them all has to be Maria Oktia Briskaya. Back in 1941, in the thick of World War II, fascist Germany betrayed the Soviet Union. Breaking a treaty of non-aggression, Germany attacked the Soviet city of Kiev, killing thousands of Soviet soldiers, Damn. one of which was Ilya Oktia Brinsky, Maria's husband. This news would be enough to send most people into a breakdown, but not Mariah. Oh no, she was going to break even. Grieving and enraged, Mariah sold everything she owned and used the money to buy a T-32 tank. But instead of donating the tank to the army, she sent a letter to the top man in charge, Joseph Stalin, explaining she wanted to pilot the tank to take revenge. Stalin was so impressed by her gusto, he gave her the go-ahead, and even granted her request that the tank be called Fighting Girlfriend. After five months of training as a tank driver, mechanic, Mariah was ready. But she was ridiculed by her comrades and seen as something of a joke. However, this just fueled Mariah's need for revenge even further. So much so that in her very first tank battle in 1943, Fighting Girlfriend was the first tank to breach enemy lines. She lay waste to a German artillery gun and mowed down more than 50 enemy soldiers in her way. And she was just getting started. Oh my god! Her slaughtering spree lasted for just over a year, when, just like her husband, she was killed in battle. But by that point, she'd gotten her revenge and made the fascists regret ever messing with a Soviet woman. Damn, bitch! Burning Bush. Ooh. Doing work for a family. Is this a story about chlamydia? Not that I know anything about that stuff. <laughs> it's... Sorry, Gina. <laughs> family member sometimes means they'll ask for the famous family discount. But there's a big difference between a discount and refusing to pay, as Reddit user Boss Necromancer discovered. He'd done four weeks of back-breaking yard work for his auntie who'd promised to pay him some 200 bucks a week. However, when he went to collect, his auntie said she was using the full family discount and straight up refused to pay him. Ah, oh, fight this hoe. Ah, oh, kick this out, this bitch. <laughs> I'll give a shit. What was he gonna do? Take back the work he'd done? She clearly thought she'd won. That was until, at midnight that night, she woke up to find her entire garden had been set on fire. And while she couldn't prove it was Os Necromancer, she knew. And he knew. Guess you could call that the scorched earth tactic. Trick or cheat. There's nothing that breaks your heart quite like being cheated on. <sighs> Trust me, I know. But luckily, stories of cheaters getting their just desserts helps fill the void more than ice cream and chick flicks. And one such What do watches chick flicks to get over a crazy bitch? Story that really hits the spot was left by a throwaway Reddit account, who I'll refer to as Elon. 
Elon was on social media one day when he realized he'd stumbled onto the secret account of his best friend's wife. Elon Musk! She was flirting with one of the other friends, and it was pretty obvious they'd been, uh, getting busy together, if you catch my drift. Elon immediately told his best friend, who I'll call Jeff, and naturally, the guy was crushed. After stewing on the information for a few weeks, he asked Elon not to say a word about what he knew. Elon promised he wouldn't. And from then on, every time he saw Jeff and his wife, the couple seemed perfectly happy and like nothing was wrong. But nine months later, it all changed. Out of the blue, Jeff revealed he had a gambling addiction. He'd lost everything. He'd sold their cars and leased new ones, losing all the money to gambling. All of their savings, 401 retirement earnings, every last penny was gone. She immediately filed for divorce. No alimony was owed, and so the entire thing was finalized without him ever mentioning her cheating. And because all the money was gone, all she was able to claim were some bits of furniture, along with a few pots and pans. Little did she know, however, Jeff's gambling addiction was a complete fabrication. Yeah, he'd stashed all the cash in secret accounts, made up the lie, and because she assumed the money was just gone, he got her to leave without giving her a cent. Oh, man. Some might call that sneaky, but I call it the cheater tax. Getting the itch. This one's gotta be about chlamydia. Because I'm clearly still very bitter about being cheated on, it's time to reveal a story of God-tier cheater revenge, enacted by a Reddit user I'll call Dose, from more than 15 years ago. Dose married his childhood sweetheart. And while he went on to pursue a master's in engineering... Let me guess, she cheated on him. What? I'm just watching a story like you guys. I don't know stuff. She was finishing a doctorate in anthropology. Over the summer, she was given the opportunity to earn some extra money as an aide on a six-week trip to Jamaica. While Dose knew he'd miss her, he supported her completely and went as far as to do extra work while she was away to financially match what she was making. Yep, definitely got cheated on. But after the trip, one of the other students told Dose that his wife and their professor had been hooking up all over the island. Ah! At first, Dose didn't believe this. Ah! He'd met the professor. Heck, he'd invited him into their home for barbecue and beers. But one evening, he broke down and checked her emails. Not only were they sleeping together in his bed, oh! but they were mocking Dose in email after email for not knowing about it. Yeah. Dose was crushed. Yeah. For several weeks, he said nothing and soon began noticing that studying late was clearly code for being with the professor. He felt so stupid. But then he decided to do something about it. Now, one thing he and his wife did do was These hoes ain't loyal, man. make their own personal lubricant which they seasoned with uh, devil's lettuce, if you know what I mean. What? Figuring his wife and the professor were making liberal use of the lube, he decided to season a new batch with a little extra something. Syphilis. <laughs> yeah. Birdman hand rub. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Something. Poison ivy. A few days later, she'd left for a late night study group. When she got back and hit up the shower, Dose changed the contact information in her phone, swapping his name for the professor's. The next morning, she thought she was texting the professor, but it was Dose that received a message reading, I'm super itchy, are you okay? Dose, who was downstairs making breakfast, replied as the professor, I'm sorry, but I've got herpes, and I guess you do now too. He then continued that he was interested in a new, younger assistant of his, so they needed to break it off. Suddenly, she stormed downstairs and angrily started eating breakfast before making an excuse and dashing out the door. Dose took this opportunity to open her laptop, delete her entire thesis, then slyly follow her. She ended up, to no one's surprise, at the professor's office where she stormed in and demanded to see him that instant. When Dose entered his office, she was crying and screaming at the professor in front of all his staff for giving her herpes. Oh! Mm, I bet that professor was as confused as he was embarrassed. But this was only the beginning of the fallout. Obviously, Dose filed for divorce, getting the majority of the assets thanks to his ex-wife's very public admittance to being unfaithful. 
The professor was kicked out of the university for breaking the code of conduct. Yeah, usually no one even finds out that a wife is boning a bunch of other dudes. And the other time that they do find out, courts don't care. Really only men cheating is a reason to get divorced and lose half your stuff. Women cheating is just, you know, she's keeping herself mentally strong, doing push-ups on another man's penis. Man could never find a job beyond teaching in a high school. Oh, and the ex-wife never got her doctorate though she did get well and truly schooled in the art of revenge. Which of these revenge stories do you think went the furthest? Possibly the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. Those stories were so much worse than the ones I have. Me and about four of my homies, back when we was younger, I was like 14 and a half, we didn't really have any females. One guy in our group, his name was Terrell, and he got women but none of us had ever gotten any women. And one night, this one dude who had been acting like he was going depressed and going through all of this crap, he said he wanted to join our group and like kick it with us and hang out. So we let him hang out with us and Terrell somehow was able to magically convince these four Latino females to come over and hang out with us. They come over and when they get there, they trying to get beaten down, you know what I'm saying? Not in a bad way, but in the consensual kind of way. They chose up on all of us, well, we all got a female except for the dude that we let come over and hang out, you know, because he was super nerdy and acted weird around the women and they didn't like that. So because the women were kissing on us, he acted real weird and loud and started screaming and yelling and throwing shit and the women left because they got scared and uncomfortable. In order to get revenge on this dude, man, while the homies jumped him, I went and peed into a huge vat of lemonade that wasn't even in there no more. Like it was an empty vat of lemonade. I peed up in there, like, oh, I released the beast up in there. Then I had my homeboy Javier release the beast up in there. Then we put a bunch of water, lemons, and sugar in them shits. And then after he got done getting beaten up by the homies, me and the homie Javier gave him, came and gave him a glass of lemonade to make him feel better about getting jumped. Cause you need your electrolytes after you exert yourself physically by getting beaten the hell up. But we felt bad after he drank it all and then told him to his face that he had drank and pee so that he could um, feel better about that. Moral of the story is don't hang out with losers. You think you're helping them, but all you're gonna do is bring the vibe down of your entire group. And then when you try to hold them accountable for the dumb crap they do, they'll play the victim. Don't do it to yourself. But this is your boy Blasphemous HD, and you stay classy, Las Vegas. Twisms.